Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Lung Cancer Precision Medicine Summit. We have such a busy schedule and so much to talk about that I want to get started right away. So before we get started, I wanted to thank our generous partners for making this event possible. Thanks to Amgen, AstraZeneca, Blueprint Medicines, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, Novartis, and Pfizer. We have a lot to discuss. Um, we're going to start talking about a high-level background of biomarker testing. Then um, one of our speakers, Dr. Shank, is going to talk about um, precision medicine, what's actually available to lung cancer patients, and some new approvals. And then Dr. Dagogo Jack is going to um, talk about some new research and COVID-19. Then I'll talk about our forthcoming biomarker resources and then we'll have time for Q&A. So feel free to uh, type your questions in the Q&A box and we will hopefully get to most of them at the end. So I'm really thrilled to be joined by two wonderful women who I really admire. They're leaders in their field, Dr. Erin Shank and Dr. Ibiayi Dagogo Jack. Dr. Erin Shank is an assist assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Medical Oncology at the University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus. And she specializes in thoracic oncology. The Shank Lab is part of the Thoracic Oncology Research Initiative at the University of Colorado and investigates the lung cancer tumor microenvironment as a contributor to lung cancer progression and treatment resistance. So really fascinating stuff. And Dr. Dagogo Jack is an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a thoracic oncologist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Her clinical interests include lung cancer, mesothelioma, clinical trials, the development of novel drug combinations, and targeted therapies for the treatment of lung cancer. So two experts that have a lot to say about this topic. And I'm Carly Ornstein. I'm the National Director of Lung Cancer Education here at the American Lung Association. I'm a health educator, and um, I will be going through some high-level background stuff about precision medicine and handling the Q&A at the end. And I also wanted to introduce the potential background noise that you might hear because they're really cute, but uh, given the current state of the pandemic affairs, I don't have anywhere to send them during this um, webinar. So these are my kids and my dog, and hopefully they'll be quiet, but uh, I know that you'll understand if there's a little bit of background noise. Okay, so let's jump into Precision Medicine 101, because um, I think this might be helpful to frame the conversation for what our experts are going to talk about. And this is from a perspective of a health educator, so I hope my scientist colleagues on the phone don't cringe too hard, and I hope my experts will correct me if I say anything wrong. But I'm going to start with some basic terms. So our cells are made up of DNA, which can be thought of as an instruction manual for the cell. And the DNA is made up of genes. So you can think of the genes as the chapters in the instruction manual. And each chapter helps to tell the cell how to produce a specific protein, which can be thought of like a chemical tool that the cell uses to do its job. So usually everything works very well, and the instruction manual and the chapters tell the cell exactly what needs to be done, and it does it fine. But Sometimes there's error in the genes. Maybe a chapter is missing or out of order, or there's some misspellings, and this gives the proteins wrong instructions, which can result in the wrong action happening. An example of a wrong action could be uncontrolled cell growth, which can lead to cancer. So the idea with precision medicine is if we can figure out where the error is, we can treat it in a targeted way. So historically, advanced stage lung cancer was mainly treated with chemotherapy, which kills healthy cells and cancer cells. But by finding out the specific genetic changes that are causing the cancer, we can be more precise with the treatments, and those treatments are sometimes called targeted therapy. So really the first step in deciding on treatment is to see if a lung cancer patient has any of these gene changes. These are these deletions, insertions, rearrangements in those chapters that I referenced. And there's currently FDA-approved lung cancer treatments 
for tumors showing abnormalities in the following genes. We have EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, B600, MET, RET, and NTREC. Now this might mean absolutely nothing to you, but it might mean something very specific to you if you have lung cancer and you have one of those um, abnormalities. So while the doctors are looking for are there abnormalities in those genes, they're also looking to see if there's something, uh, the level of something called PDL1 and now TMB, which stands for tumor mutational burden. And that little bubble says, hi, I'm new here because this was actually just approved yesterday. So the wonderful thing about working in this field is the fast progress that's being made. And I was furiously updating my slides as of yesterday just because a new pr approval came in. So it's just really an exciting time in lung cancer. So PDL1 and TMB are markers that have implications for immunotherapy treatment. And you've probably heard about immunotherapy. Immunotherapy helps harness the immune system to attack the cancer. And it's kind of like another wing of precision medicine. So you're looking at um, the errors in the genes to treat with targeted therapies, but you also want to look to see if there are certain markers that might help influence if a patient will be eligible or respond well to a certain type of immunotherapy. And the most progress in immunotherapy for lung cancer has been made in a type of drug called an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So immune checkpoints are molecules on the immune cells that can start or stop an immune response. And the immune system uses these molecules to help determine what's normal and what should be attacked. And cancer cells sometimes trick these checkpoints to stop the body from attacking them. And drugs can target these checkpoints and help them respond against cancer cells. So there are several drugs that target immune checkpoints that are approved for treatment in lung cancer. And many of these drugs block or inhibit the contact between the PDL1 protein, which is shown here um, attached to the cancer cell in red. It's like that little thing that says PDL1 and has the red squiggles. Um, and it blocks the interaction between that and the PD1 receptor, which is attached to the T cell, which is another name for immune cell. It's the blue thing that's attached to the T cell. So the PDL1, PD1 interaction function as, functions as a break that prevents the immune system from responding to cancer. And by blocking this interaction with an inhibitor, that's what that little green Y-shaped thing is, the immune system can then recognize the cancer cell and attack it. So that's in the picture on the right. Um, you see that the um, inhibitor has blocked the reaction, and now the T cell, the immune cell, can attack the cancer cell. So a PDL1 test measures what percentage of cells in a tumor express PDL1. And tumors that express high amounts of PDL1, which is 50% or greater, may respond particularly well to checkpoint inhibitors. So if you're interested in more about this, um, I encourage you to go to lung.org slash immunotherapy, where we go into much more detail. And also, so the other immunotherapy biomarker that is important um, is tumor mutational burden, TMB, that I was talking about that was just approved yesterday. So simply put, the, the TMB is the number of mutations per coding error area of your genome. What does that really mean? Basically, what for our purposes today, um, it sounds technical, but the main takeaway is the higher number of mutations the greater chance that someone may respond to immunotherapy. So it's just another way to decide what is the best treatment for the patient. So just to recap a little bit, identifying if there's any gene changes causing problems and knowing a patient's levels of immunotherapy markers like PDL1 and TMB both help influence a patient's treatment options. Those gene changes and PDL1 and TMB levels are markers in the body or biomarkers that provide clues about what's driving the cancer. And oncologists want to be armed with as much information as possible when they're deciding how to treat a patient's cancer. And that's why biomarkers are so important in cancer treatment and why we consider them an integral part of precision medicine. So another analogy 
it's a food analogy, which I love food analogies, is let's say you wanted to make your friend their most favorite meal. You probably wouldn't just make spaghetti and hope that that was the best meal for your friend because a lot of people like spaghetti. You would want to find out what are their preferences? Are there any food allergies? What's going on? So you get the idea. Um, you know, we want to learn more about what's going on in the cancer and what's going on in the body so that the treatment can be nice and precise. So you might be wondering how this biomarker testing is done. And the gold standard is a tissue biopsy. That means tissue from a patient's lung is analyzed for gene changes that I mentioned before. Furthermore, the gold standard for analyzing those changes is through something called next generation sequencing, which looks for a large number of possible gene changes at one time. This is also sometimes called comprehensive genomic testing. Liquid biopsies also might be used in certain situations, particularly when it might be too challenging or unsafe to do a tissue biopsy. And a liquid biopsy is just a simple blood draw. Tumors shed their DNA into the bloodstream, so the liquid biopsies can be effective in looking for certain biomarkers in the blood. And I wanted to say a little something about the phrase biomarker testing, which I've said a couple times now. This type of testing goes by many aliases. Uh, you might have heard it called genetic testing, genomic testing, molecular profiling, tumor testing, just to name a few. But my colleagues at the Lung Action Network, Lung Cancer Action Network, have spent a lot of time studying this language. And much of the lung cancer community has committed to using the phrase biomarker testing, which is inclusive of those gene changes I was talking about, plus those immunotherapy markers. And it's also a clearer term, which is why we favor it, because um, a lot of people think that those mutations are things that you inherit from your parents or that they're heritable, but they're actually not. They're changes that happen to your cells over time. So that's why things like genetic testing might be a little confusing and biomarker testing is a little more accurate. So the bottom line, I'm going to go back, sorry. The bottom line is that um, for many years, lung cancer patients with advanced disease were treated with a somewhat one-size-fits-all approach. But researchers have made amazing progress in figuring out how to target the lung cancer in a more precise way. And actually, lung cancer is kind of leading the field of cancer in this. Um, most patients with advanced, cancer, advanced lung cancer should receive this comprehensive biomarker testing looking for all the possible gene changes in the tumor as well as those immunotherapy markers. And treating a patient without having this full picture is really just not the standard of care. And we want to make sure that all patients who are eligible have access to the best care possible. So that's one reason why we keep talking about this really important topic. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Erin Shanks to talk a little bit more about the different types of precision medicine that are available for lung cancer patients. Dr. Shank? Thank you so much, Carly, and um, good morning to everyone uh, from Colorado. I'm Dr. Erin Shank. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Colorado. I take care of lung cancer patients in the clinic, and I also lead a translational research lab trying to better understand some of the mechanisms of resistance to the therapies we have. Um, I'm really glad to be able to talk with this group today about biomarker testing because it's so critical for any new patient who's diagnosed with advanced or metastatic lung cancer because biomarker testing is the way Doctors like I, you know, identify these cancer cell vulnerabilities, which in turn um, uh, gives me a, the, the best idea as to how to first treat patients when I, I meet them in the clinic. And I'm going to talk about the different types of targeted therapies available and hopefully expand your thinking about what really is a targeted therapy. I'll talk about therapies that target the cancer cell. Those are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as well as antibody uh, drug conjugates, as well as immunotherapy, which don't always target the cancer cell, but target the immune cells within a patient. So these cancer-targeted therapies, really the, the treatments that classically people think about when um, uh, we talk about targeted therapies are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And these are really designer drugs. These are molecules that have been engineered to specifically inhibit uh, 
certain mutations or abnormalities within the cancer cell. And what happens is these, are, these, these drugs are sort of like a stop sign. So when mutations or fusions are present in the cancer cells, that's a green light to the cancer cell just to go, 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 to grow, divide, and spread. And these designer molecules, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, stop these growth and survival signals um, from these abnormalities. A second type of targeted therapy that's quite a little more new than tyrosine kinase inhibitors is something called an antibody drug conjugate. And so what this molecule does is it's able to recognize specific proteins that are on the surface of the cancer cell, and that's done through the antibody portion of this drug. And then once it's bound to the cancer cell, once it recognizes that specific protein on the cancer cell surface, the, the whole complex is pulled into the cancer cell and it delivers its chemotherapy payload that it's linked to. Immunotherapy is in, in the lung cancer field right now is done through um, uh, treatments called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what these are is these are antibodies or molecules that prevent T cells from receiving a shutdown signal from the cancer cells or tissue environment. So a little bit more about these precision therapies and um, you know, how they're tolerated. So again, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these are very specific to uh, particular mutations or abnormalities in the cancer cell, and that's why they're often so well tolerated. These are designer drugs that really only interfere with the, nor with the activity of cells if they have their specific abnormality or mutations. We do see side effects with these therapies, of course, but often with a lesser, to a lesser degree than what we usually see with chemotherapy medicine. So one of the ways we determine uh, whether patients can receive these tyrosine kinase inhibitors is looking for specific mutations, fusions, or even amplifications. And what these are broadly are abnormalities within the cancer cell. And what we understand about all of these is that the cancer cell becomes very addicted to it. It becomes dependent on these abnormalities to grow and survive. So by looking for these particular abnormalities in the cancer cell, we know what, to what um, medicine the cancer cells are, um, are vulnerable to. I won't go through all of these uh, medicines or well as, or the abnormalities, but I just want to say that there are many um, designer drugs available for these different abnormalities that we can find in lung cancer cells. And sometimes we have, in certain categories, we have um, medicines available that we can use um, right out the gate. Sometimes we have medicines available that are better used uh, when you need something different than the first treatment uh, patients were started on. And I won't, I won't go through all of these. So the antibody drug conjugates, as I mentioned, this is a really, this is a new entry to the armamentarium or the toolbox that we have as medical oncologists. And, and again, similarly to what I spoke about before, is that these are molecules that recognize proteins or surface markers on the cancer cells. And what happens is that this drug is pulled into the cancer cell, and once in the cancer cell, this, the, this, uh, this therapy releases a chemotherapy. So it's really more like a directed chemotherapy treatment. There are some toxicities that can occur with this. Uh, sometimes it can happen because uh, the, the molecule itself, it can have an early release of the chemotherapy, or more rarely, uh, these molecules recognize healthy cells and can re release the chemotherapy payload on some of the healthy cells. Uh, recently, there was a new approval um, that came out of, I believe, the, it was either AACR or the ASCO meeting, so one of our uh, recent scientific meetings within the past few weeks, where patients whose uh, lung cancer expresses a HER2 mutation can um, try to can can receive one of these antibody drug con conjugates, and that's currently now FDA approved and available. <laughs> 
Now, immunotherapy, so shifting away a little bit, the treatments I just spoke about are treatments that target the cancer cells themselves, but immunotherapy operates under a different idea. So in a healthy immune system, normally these T cells, these are immune cells within your body that are built to fight any invaders like infection, viruses, or even abnormal cells. And the way they get activated is they receive multiple signals from, from, the, um, from the tissue it's in, and it, it brings together all the information to better understand whether to attack or whether to remain dormant. And so cancer cells exploit this normal process, and what they do is they overexpress um, proteins that prevent the T cells from getting activated. So they overexpress a protein that is a stop signal to these T cells. And immunotherapy comes in and it blocks the stop sign. It prevents that stop sign from getting to uh, the T cells, resulting in the T cells being able to become activated and kill the cancer cells. Now, the toxicity can occur in this setting uh, because the um, while the, the T cells can recognize and kill the cancer cells, sometimes healthy tissues are also injured in the process. One of the ways we try and determine how and when to use immunotherapy is looking at specific uh, biomarkers on the expression of these cancer cells. So PDL1, that's the stop sign I was referring to. That's the stop sign for the T cells. And right now in clinical practice, if you have high PDL1 or greater than 50%, you can potentially receive immunotherapy alone. Or if it's less than 50%, often we recommend um, pembrolizumab, or excuse me, immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. And that can be used um, with either um, adenocarcinoma histology or squamous cell uh, histology of advanced or metastatic lung cancer. For uh, completeness sake, there is a new scoring system that's available for another type of immunotherapy, but um, it's very infrequently used in clinical practice. So again, the, the types of precision medicines that are available for lung cancer patients, it really is a personalized therapy approach where your medical oncologist um, will perform um, biomarker testing to better understand the vulnerabilities within your cancer cells. And these results help us choose what therapies to offer to patients or what's the best chance of being able to shrink and control the cancer for as long as possible. You know, I'd like to highlight uh, some of the advances and approvals that have been made recently in the lung cancer space because as we keep working towards better, better understanding what drives lung cancer, we also continue to get better in designing ways to um, inhibit the lung, can lung cancer growth and spread. So this first slide I call drugging the undruggable. And what that means is that for decades, for as, really for as long as we've been sequencing to better understand um, lung cancer drivers, we've known about um, two to uh, mutations that traditionally are unresponsive to the therapies we have. So one is a specific type of EGFR mutation. This is an exon 20 insertion. And these, uh, this particular uh, type of EGFR mutation is not responsive to the TKIs for EGFR that we've had available for, for, for decades, or I shouldn't say decades, but for years. And recently, uh, mobile certinib has been um, uh, has received FDA breakthrough therapy uh, designation because this treatment is able to get you know, about 43% of patients on an early phase clinical trial to experience a response to uh, this therapy. This is just one of the potential uh, therapies for exon 20 mutations. There's a number still coming through the pipeline, and I'm really excited to have all of this activity in this space. Another big undruggable target was, is a mutation KRAS G12C. So this is about as frequent as EGFR mutations in um, lung adenocarcinoma. And this has been a, um, 
uh, an area where years and years of research and persistence have really finally paid off in being able to um, develop a number of compounds that are able to inhibit this mutation. Right now, they are in early stage clinical trials and working through the clinical trial system. And my hope is that at some point, we will be able to offer targeted therapy to patients with this very common mutation. There's also been a number of new targets identified. So RET fusions are um, abnormalities that drive about 1% to 2% of uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And recently, uh, sulfurcatinib has been FDA approved for RET positive uh, cancers. There was a really remarkable response rate seen in this early phase clinical trial where about 85% of patients had some sort of disease shrinkage on this therapy. And very importantly, for a lot of these targeted therapies, this is able to get into the, the brain tissue. And also, in some patients, it's able to show activity against tumors that might have spread to the brain. Uh, another new target is a MET exon 14 skipping mutation. Capmatinib has recently received um, accelerated approval based on a phase two trial. And again, a, a, a very good response rate, almost 70%, and also a very good response, response rate within um, the tumors that might be in the, in the brain tissue. And then also, uh, finally, new approaches to targeting lung cancer, and these, again, are these antibody drug conjugates where there is the antibody that recognizes certain proteins on the cancer cell surface. There's a linker that, that connects the antibody to its chemotherapy payload. And again, recently, there's an FDA breakthrough designation for a trastuzumab molecule based on the ongoing phase two trial, where an overall response rate of about 70% has been noted in patients with these particular HER2 mutations. There are a number of ADCs or antibody drug conjugates that are working their way through um, uh, clinical trials. And my hope is that this will be a new and developing, um, uh, developing area of investigation to try to expand targeted therapy to an even more uh, broader population so that we have TKIs, antibody drug conjugates, as well as immunotherapies to offer our patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Shank. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Degogo jack for her portion. Thank you so much. Perfect. Hi. I'm, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Vivi Degogo jack and I'm one of the thoracic oncologists here at Mass General. And it's my pleasure to be on this call today. Uh, I, as a uh, as Carly discussed, I, I'm a clinical trialist, and I'm, I have a particular interest in studying novel approaches to treating cancer and precision medicine approaches. And with the framework that was just provided by Dr. Shank, I, I wanted to focus on a couple of exciting new areas that are under development for where precision medicine is being applied, either through novel targeting techniques or also kind of in a new space. The first area to focus on is in the localized lung cancer setting. So a lot of the... I wanted to make it clear up front that a lot of our, or all of our approvals actually for targeted therapy are in patients with advanced disease or patients with metastatic stage four lung cancer, and kind of a handful of patients with stage three B or kind of more advanced stage three lung cancer that wasn't amenable to kind of curative intent therapies. But many of our patients actually present with curable lung cancer and they receive therapies with curative intent. And what we mean by curative intent therapies are surgeries and radiation. And the goal is to cure our patients, but many patients ultimately relapse and can succumb to their cancer. And so these approaches that we have traditionally used are, are not adequate for most of our patients. As you can see from the curves on the left, um, these curves are, just to walk you through the figure, this curve is a survival curve showing the proportion of patients who are alive at, uh, at, at basically six years after their original diagnosis or after surgery. And what you can see is that each of the colors indicates a particular stage of presentation. The blue is a stage one, and the bottom curve, the gold one, or the brownish color is stage 3C. And what you can, and the, it basically, it lines up with the table under it. And what you can see is that while most patients, greater than 90% or so, of patients with stage 1A lung cancer are alive at six years, five years, um, the number steeply drops off for our patients with stage 3 lung cancer is less than 20%. We have a lot of room for improvement. 
as far as approvals in this space after surgery or things we can do to improve the chances that our patients are cured, all we have is chemotherapy, and chemotherapy is not very effective. It, it, it improves the chance of survival by 5 to 15%, depending on the context. But it's important to note that those molecular alterations or those mutations, fusions that Dr. Shank described are not unique to stage 4 lung cancer. We actually see them in, in surgical surgically resected or removed tumors too. It's just the targeted therapies to date haven't really been thoroughly investigated in this space. I put up a pie chart from our institution here at Mass General looking at the molecular alterations or the mutations and, and rearrangements that were seen in 750 surgically removed cancers. And what you can see is that there's similar themes uh, to what we saw in the advanced stage setting. And the proportion of these mutations are actually quite comparable to the advanced stage setting. And so there is an opportunity here. And so there's ongoing investigation in this space looking at, you know, can we move up our precision medicine approaches to the space, including immunotherapies, and can that improve the chance of cure? And so I've talked around the term adjuvant therapy, and I know that all of us are from different backgrounds, so I think it's important to kind of define the intent of adjuvant therapies. So these are therapies that we give after surgery with the intent of improving the chances of cure. And there can be, if it can involve immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and kind of other approaches. The ongoing, a couple of the ongoing studies are highlighted on this slide. The first is an ECOG acronym study that's looking at after patients receive the standard therapy, being surgery and then chemotherapy at their uh, practicing oncologist discretion. But you know, the typical standard therapy, patients are randomized to then receive either observation on the volume app, which is an immune therapy for a year. And there's another study at the bottom, which is a biomarker selected population for patients with ALK rearranged lung cancer, which we see in about 3 to 5 percent of patients with lung cancer. Here patients are randomized after surgery to receive either electinib, which is an approved ALK inhibitor for patients who have stage 4 lung cancer, versus chemotherapy. These studies are ongoing, so we, we, won't, have, uh, we won't have readouts for a while for these studies. I think it's important to note the typical outcomes of these adjuvant studies. In general, people are looking for disease-free survival, which is a term that denotes kind of the time from randomization to when the cancer comes back or the patient passes a, a patient under treatment passes away. Overall survival is just the time from when you are assigned to treatment or randomized to the time of death. And I think it's also very important to assess safety and tolerability of these drugs because Many of these studies have patients on our targeted therapies for two to three years or so, and there's cumulative toxicity. And so with that in mind, I wanted to highlight a study called the ADOR study. This is a study that generated a lot of buzz in the last month based on the, its presentation at ASCO. And so this is a phase three study for patients with EGFR positive lung cancer. In the metastatic setting, 15% of patients have EGFR mutations. And so in our pie charter, in our experience looking at that same population in uh, resected lung cancer, it seems pretty proportional. So you might be, this, this study might impact 15% of patients in Western populations. In this study, patients were randomized after they received, they underwent surgery and received chemotherapy to either have placebo or osimertinib, which is an approved targeted therapy for stage 4 EGFR mutant lung cancer. They, were, they received treatment for three years. And the primary endpoint or outcome they were looking for is to see whether or not giving someone a targeted therapy earlier for early stage disease would improve their chance of the cancer not coming back and their chance of survival, so disease-free survival at three years. And as you see in these curves, uh, which is uh, basically a curve looking at disease-free survival, I would ignore uh, the pink arrows for now. The top curve is looking at patients who received the intervention, osimertinib, and the bottom curve is looking at patients who are randomized to the placebo arm. This is looking particularly in patients with stage 2 and 3A disease because that was a population of interest in this study, mainly because, as we saw from those curves, patients with stage 1 lung cancer tend to do well, and so the patients who have the highest risk of lung cancer relapse are those with stage 2 or stage 3 lung cancer. And what they found in the study that actually led to unblinding of the study early was that there was an overwhelming benefit that favored the intervention or the targeted therapy. 
And if we look at the curves, the x-axis is looking at the time. It is the time, and then the y-axis is looking at the proportion of patients who were free of disease at each time point. If we kind of focus our eyes on, I think, the most relevant one at this point, the 24-month or the two-year cutoff, we see that only 10% of patients in the intervention arm or had relapsed, amounting to a disease-free survival of 90% versus 55% of patients in the uh, control arm who had relapsed. And so this, this, gener this was a very exciting data to see and generated a lot of enthusiasm. But as mentioned, this is the stage two and three population and patients with stage 1B lung cancer, which you usually get that designation because you have a tumor larger than uh, four centimeters, which may not involve lymph nodes, but we know those are also about stage one cancers at risk for relapse too. So those patients often have conversations about chemotherapy after surgery. And so it was promising to see that the benefit extended to these patients as well. But as you might imagine, it was, the, it was more, most magnified for patients who had higher risk cancers. And so these data have generated a lot of kind of uh, debate in the field amongst my colleagues and people in my area of practice about what is the right thing to do. Are the data convincing enough that we should right now uh, hopefully with uh, gaining of approval by regulatory bodies, the FDA and other, uh, other practicing bodies, whether or not we should actually, it, it's, it's best for us to give our patients this therapy now, or whether it makes sense for us to wait for more data. So people fall into two camps with respect to this decision. And the camps are driven by the fact that some people want to see longer follow-up. They want to see whether or not this, this approach leads to a benefit in terms of overall survival. Because what we can't tell from the data right now or whether, is whether or not we're just suppressing disease versus curing it. The next area I wanted to focus on is uh, MET amplified lung cancer. So to date, our approvals of targeted therapies are for lung cancers that have particular types of genetic alterations that send kind of growth signals to the cancer. These are mutations and rearrangements but we don't have approved lung cancers for patients with amplification. And that, that basically, amplification means you have many extra copies of a particular gene, which leads to an enhancing of kind of growth, basically activates a receptor or growth signal. And MET amplification is, well, MET is one of the genes that's amplified in lung cancer. And so one to 5% of untreated lung cancers will have amplification of the MET gene. And it seems that, you know, having many, many extra copies of the MET gene, like 10 to 20, is rarer than having a few extra copies. The reason that I, I point this out is that in clinical trials, when you, when you give patients MET targeting drugs, one of which was approved for MET mutations, catmatinib, it seems that it, the response to these drugs may depend on how many extra MET copies you have. As seen in this figure, which I, I admit is a little complicated, so I'll walk you through it. So this is from a recent review from Alex, Alex Drillen's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And in the vertical column, we see uh, lung cancer drugs that the patients received, as well as the context within which they received it. And in the x-axis, it, it's measured in objective response, the likelihood of responding to that therapy. You can see there's many different circles. Some of them are smaller than others. Each circle represents a study, and the size of the circle indicates the number of patients with MET amplification in that study. So a bigger circle means that there were more patients with this uh, MET amplification in that study that were evaluated for the outcome of response. You might also note that some of the circles are darker than the others, and that's because the studies, that there were different cutoffs, how many extra MET copies you had to have to meet the criteria to be eligible for the study. And the ones with the red, the dark red circles are the ones that required more MET copies. And I think that it's apparent that there's a trend on this graph or on this picture that the darker circles tend to correlate with a higher response rate. And so that, theory, so that population of patients was uh, particularly evaluated for a response to capmatinib. And capmatinib is a MET-targeted therapy that was recently approved but not for met, extra MET copies or MET amplification, but for, for the MET mutation. And it, embedded in that trial that led to the approval of catmatinib for MET mutations was a po enrolling in a population of patients who didn't have a MET mutation but had extra MET copies or MET amplification to see if the drug would work in these patients. And so there are two groups of patients, 
the yellow box of the yellow cohort is for patients who had previously already received the treatment for their cancer, typically not a MET-directed therapy, things like chemo or immune therapy. And the red box is for patients who had been untreated for their cancer, who had MET amplification. And what this study was looking at is the response rate, how many tumors uh, shrink from this approach. And what you can see is that in the treated population, the objective response rate as outlined in the red box, the ORR, was 29% for patients who had been treated before and 40% for people who were untreated for their cancer. And the disease control rate was about 70% in both arms. And I recognize that we all have different backgrounds. I think it's important to define these terms. So when we assess whether or not a targeted therapy or basically any, any therapy works in lung cancer, it typically involves, in, in the context of a clinical trial, working with radiologists or working with investigators, to measure a few areas that we think are representative of the burden or the bulk of the tumor and see how they change over time on treatment. We define something as an objective response or when there's more than 30% shrinkage of the kind of the sum of the diameters of these areas, of these representative lesions. A complete response, of course, is when they completely go away. And an objective response means that there's either 30% shrinkage or it went away, basically a partial or a complete response. We call something stable disease when it looks, it stays the same size or doesn't grow by more than 20%. And so the designator of disease control rate incorporates all of those groups, those with stable disease and those who had a part of some sort of response to therapy. And I think it's important, you know, objective response is great. It's always good to have shrinkage, but controlling disease is equally great as long as someone is not very symptomatic from their cancer. So a 70% disease control rate could be a good thing. When we assess responses to therapy, it's also important to consider how long are patients responding to treatment. And for that, we look at progression-free survival. In this study, it was about four months in both of the study groups, and overall survival was about 10 months. I present this study not because, it, you know, honestly, when you look at the numbers, they're not, they don't actually stand up very well next to our approved targeted therapies. But I present it because we, this is a population where the genetic alteration, met amplification, is associated with a more aggressive cancer, it, in my personal experience. So I'm excited that there's, we're starting to have studies in this space, and I'm excited about the potential to repurpose drugs that are already approved, for this, approved for um, MET-driven cancers. I hope that we'll continue to uh, investigate this area of lung cancer, and I think that we'll probably see that there's over, the reason that we're not getting these robust responses is that there's probably overlap of other growth signals in some of these tumors, and so I think the jury is still out in this area. Another, another uh, type of alteration I wanted to focus on is HER2 exon 20 insertions. Dr. Shank briefly mentioned these. They're seen in 1 to 2 percent of lung cancer, and we don't have approved therapies. But we know that based on breast cancer, where HER2 is basically the, the first area that they were, basically the first area of targeted therapy, um, we can sometimes borrow drugs that are approved in breast cancer. And in phase two studies, one particular drug called TDM1, also called adotrastuzumab and tansin, uh, led to very promising responses in a, in, a, in a small study that was conducted at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so the drug that Dr. Uh, Shank mentioned, uh, TDXD or trastuzumab deroxycan, it's kind of it's an antibody drug conjugate whose mechanism we're not all familiar with based on Dr. Shank's uh, presentation. It, it's almost, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, a turbo uh, TDM1, basically, in that it packs more chemotherapy molecules with it. And it also has this advantage of what we call a bystander effect, where it can, it, it can bind to the a protein on the outside of one cell, but also migrate to the cells in the surrounding area, increasing the possibility of killing many cancer cells in the area. And the Destiny Lung Study was presented at ASCO this year, and this is a study looking at this drug, this trastuzumab deroxycan, in different populations of patients, and ones on this slide are patients with lung cancer who had uh, HER2 mutated lung cancer. It also looked at other types of lung cancer, but I wanted to focus on the HER2 mutant population for now. This study was seeking to see whether what was the likelihood or kind of the objective response rate with this drug in this patient population. And what they found was that 60, uh, more than 60%, so about 62% of tumors 
had an objective response. Again, that's defined as greater than 30% shrinkage of tumors with this drug. And when we look at this plot here, it's called a waterfall plot when we look at it. Anything, just to familiarize anyone, I, I apologize if this is basic for some, but anything below 0% is, is indicative of there's shrinkage in the tumor. So we can see this is a good waterfall plot in that there's a lot of shrinkage. Of, nearly every tumor basically has some, some degree of shrinkage. And when we look at other indicators of how well a drug works, including the durability of response, we see here that the progression-free survival with this drug was 14 months, so over a year. This basically is very comparable to drugs that are already approved for other types of lung cancer, like our ALK and our egfr mutant lung cancer. The overall survival curve is here, but the data are not mature enough for us to, have a, to be able to project what the average or median overall survival is. I think it's important to note, as Dr. Schenk mentioned, that the toxicities of these drugs are a little bit different, which is important when we counsel our patients about targeted therapies. Most patients, you know, appreciate that their targeted therapy pills or their TKIs, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, have fewer side effects than our typical chemotherapies. But it's important to note that drugs like this uh, antibody drug conjugate are chemotherapy. So the side effects are similar to chemotherapy, including hair loss, nausea, and low blood counts. Another important side effect that was seen here was that there was pneumonitis or inflammation of the lungs in 12% of patients. So this is a small group of patients, so we need more data, and we need to also determine whether or not the inflammation of the lungs was predisposed by people having immune therapy first or the sequence of therapies. That all needs to be sorted out. And then the other area I wanted to focus on is an EGFR exon 20 insertion. And so no, this is not a typo. There are exon 20 insertions in both EGFR and HER2, and they're pretty structurally analogous. And as Dr. Shank pointed out, this is, an, this is an area, this is a type of EGFR mutation that to date has kind of stood out from all the rest in that it really wasn't sensitive to the therapies that were approved for other EGFR mutations. I, I wanted to highlight one approach to targeting these mutations that I think is novel, and I think it's great to have these alternative strategies for targeting mutations. This is a bispecific antibody, and what that means is that there is an antibody that targets two different areas. One targets EGFR and one targets MET. So you can imagine you can capture more patients with an antibody like this, and you can also target that subgroup of patients with EGFR mutations who get new MET amplification as kind of a resistance mechanism. One of the other reasons that this type of drug is interesting is that when we give targeted therapies, the cancer becomes resistant to them at some point, and it's usually because it gets new mutations that make the targeted therapy not work, but the cancer still relies on that EGFR growth signal. So this is a type of therapy you can give after targeted therapies or pills, like TKI stop working, because the EGFR is still abnormal in those cells. And so this drug is called amavantamab, and it was investigated in multiple cohorts of patients, but the one I wanted to highlight was this population of unmet need, the EGFR exon 20 insertion patients. And so this data is looking at patients, uh, these data are looking at patients who had received chemotherapy versus those who had not. I think, to be honest, a lot of those details are not as important as seeing that because there's a consistent response of, across both of these groups. I think the important takeaway from this slide is that 40% of patients achieved a response to this drug, which is great. And the, the median duration of response and kind of the progression-free survival were on the order of 8 to 10 months, which is comparable to some of our older kind of EGFR-targeted therapies. And the way I see it is that perhaps this is the kind of therapy that you can give after your pills stop working and just gives you more of an opportunity to have multiple different therapies and we know that in other subtypes of lung cancer, the more therapies you have, the longer we can extend survival for our patients. So I think this is a welcome addition. And now I wanted to uh, shift the focus to COVID-19 and cancer because this is, you know, I get a lot of in-basket messages and calls from my patients. This is an area that's on all, at the top of all of our minds. And I think the, the first thing I always tell my patients is that, you know, the data, they're still coming in. And a lot of the information we have about COVID-19 and cancer is from the sickest patients with cancer, those who ended up in the hospital. So I'm not sure that applies to all of our patients. So we have to be a little bit cautious about how we interpret these data. But, this, but I thought I would summarize some of the relevant studies that have come out. 
And so it seems, at least in early reports, and many of these early reports have a small number of patients. They're only from one institution or institutions in only one country. And so it's tough to determine how generalizable these data will be or these observations will be. But they suggest that, you know, our patients with cancer, when they get COVID-19, they may be more likely to have severe disease. They may be more likely to end up in the ICU or to require um, a ventilator or require intubation. And they may be more likely to die from COVID-19. And it seems that, as mentioned, the mortality rate is particularly high for patients who require admission because of COVID-19. I wanted to highlight one large study that came out in the last month. This is a CCC-19 study uh, that's looking at patients who, uh, basically looking at patients who had lung cancer or had cancer in general, and it looks like there's an increased 30-day mortality, particularly for patients who were older, smoked, or had a pre multiple other illnesses. And it seems that patients with lung cancer may have a particularly higher risk in this study. And so I think it's important to look at some of the subsequent studies that have only looked at lung cancer patients. I put up this slide here, not for us to go over, but to just to show how we are restructuring care delivery for patients with lung cancer, ranging from lung screening to stage four. And I've put references here because there's a lot of thought that's gone into these uh, guidelines about how we should be deferring care and kind of restructuring it. There's one study I wanted to highlight. This is from uh, this is a Chinese study of 14 from 14 hospitals that showed, similar to CC19, that our patients with, lung, with cancer have in, may have inferior outcomes with COVID-19. But they thought in this study that perhaps patients with lung cancer had a 20% mortality rate, and those with hematologic cancers also had a higher mortality rate. This study they only had six patients who had immune therapy, but they suggested that patients with immune therapy may have uh, adverse outcomes. This was not the case, however, in a follow-up study from Memorial Sloan Kettering that looked at 70 patients. In this study, it looks like immunotherapy it does not have an adverse impact on your risk of having uh, complications from COVID-19. So when I look at these data, I say that we shouldn't be holding back immune therapy just based on small data sets, and we still don't know. We need more data. The last study I wanted to highlight is a COVID, it's basically the terrible study that's ongoing. It's a multi-institutional effort across the world. I think this is going to be one of the most informative studies to let us know how COVID-19 impacts our lung cancer patients, both in terms of outcomes right now, but also long-term outcomes. In this study, as in the Memorial Sloan Kettering study, it looks like there was a mortality rate of about 33% in patients. Again, this was a heavily hospitalized patient and not all patients had access to ICU level care. So in summary, I just I wanted to just highlight again, these are limited data, but they suggest that if our patients are hospitalized, there is a high mortality rate. But these are really heterogeneous studies. Patients didn't have access to critical care, so it's unclear how practice patterns would affect that. And it, I don't think that these studies apply to our patients with respected lung cancer, those who don't have symptoms from COVID-19. And we need more data. We need more of these terrible studies. We need to figure out like how this applies to all comers with lung cancer. And I think that we're all going to frame it in our cultural context and in, in terms of our institutional practices about how to interpret these data. So I think it's important to discuss these considerations with our patients when they ask about how COVID-19 impacts them. Okay, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, these, this webinar has been recorded, and uh, afterwards, after the webinar concludes, you'll get an email with instructions about how to access the webinar. And I did see there was a question about printing the slides, so I'm, I'm going to look into the possibility of that. Um, before we go into Q&A, I just wanted to let you know that starting in the fall, we are going to have a lot more resources on our website about biomarker testing and all of these things that the experts have talked about. Um, there's going to be probably about 25 new videos right here is Dr. Kamich, who works with Dr. Shank. Um, he's one of the, the people doing a video for us. So uh, we will communicate when those are available, but I want to get you excited about them and let you know that um, all of them will be available through lung.org slash biomarker dash testing, but please do look for some communi communication when those resources are available. So. The first thing is that several people submitted questions in advance, and I'd like to go through a couple of these. It's kind of going to be a little rapid fire because we also got 
quite a few questions in the Q&A, and do feel free to continue to type your questions into the Q&A box. So the first question is for Dr. Dagogo Jack. What is the best way to protect yourself from COVID-19 while receiving chemo? I think that we're still, uh, I think that's a very good question. And I think we're still figuring it out. I can tell you what we do here. I think it's important to, one of the biggest ways to protect yourself from COVID-19 is to minimize exposure to patients who are infected with COVID-19 uh, or to others who are infected with COVID-19. So here we actually have screening where patients are contacted the day before their visit to screen for common symptoms of COVID-19. And, and if they have them, they're asked to stay home or we try to kind of route to our clinic. We have a separate clinic right now for patients who are COVID positive who need cancer care. And so we, they would be routed to that clinic to just make sure that we're clustering patients who have already been exposed to COVID-19. The other thing is that when patients arrive for treatment, they actually get their temperature checked and they're asked again if they have symptoms. I think beyond this, our day-to-day -day lives are not like that, right? Well, you can't ask everyone you walk up to at the store if they have COVID-19. So I think that just being cautious and being aware. So wearing a mask when you're out, I, I know that there's differences in terms of like local practices for mask wearing, but I certainly think our patients with cancer should be wearing masks when they go out. I think hand hygiene is key, letting your doctor know early if you feel like you may have symptoms. Okay, great. So the next three questions are going to be for Dr. Shank. The first one is, why do EGFR markers disappear, and what makes a targeted therapy no longer effective? So for the first part of the question, the EGF markers, uh, the EGFR markers, uh, that would be, I'll answer it two ways. So first way is, that would be, you know, without knowing all the context, that would be really surprising. So for example, if someone has a biopsy of their tumor, and it's initially found to be EGFR positive, and they go on, you know, an appropriate therapy, and then are rebiopsied. Usually, we expect to see an EGFR mutation still in the tumor. It may have changed in certain ways. It may have other um, mutations along with it, um, but we expect to see it. I think there are very um, unique and specific circumstances where the marker um, might have truly disappeared, but that's that's really going to be dependent on um, um, uh, uh, the patient's situation. The other way where I could see this happening more commonly, so for example, doing circulating tumor DNA testing, where occasionally when patients have cancer abnormalities, we're able to detect that in the blood, um, we, can, we can initially see that EGFR mutation in the blood. And then with effective therapy, often that can go away. And that's more a reflection of having fewer and fewer tumor cells in the body because of the, the specifics of the testing. Having um, uh, can more cancer cells around allows the testing to be able to better detect uh, the EGFR mutation. Uh, and the other question, Carly, could you repeat the other question, please? The second sure. part? What makes the targeted therapy no longer effective? There are a number of different ways cancer cells have figured out to work around targeted therapy. So uh, one of them is the target can change. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you have an EGFR mutation, you can develop other mutations within the EGFR protein that makes the TKI no longer able to really um, fit into its, its, the EGFR mutation or it just becomes insensitive to the TKI inhibition. That's one way. So the, the target itself changes. Another way is that bypass pathways become activated. So, for example, what can happen is the cancer cell figures out, okay, the EGFR pathway is being inhibited. What are some workarounds? And so it, it can activate some of those workarounds. Um, and then, of course, th for a, a number of patients, we just don't know. We, we don't understand well enough why um, a particular therapy has, um, has stopped working. But, you know, there always is a possibility that we can identify it, and occasionally we're able to target that, that initial workaround. So having a repeat biopsy is often really important in, this, in that situation. Great. Um, the next question is, what are second-line treatments for patients taking Tegresto who have brain metastases? And you might want to 
define tigristyl and brain metastases? Absolutely. So working kind of just from what we were talking about before, it, in patients I take care of who are no longer responding um, to to Grisso, there are a couple of ways we can we can go about things. So, number one, if there is only one particular site of disease that's growing or a new one, for example, that has shown up, oftentimes we'll do something uh, local therapy. Usually this is radiation, but really what that means is we attack the one particular cancer spot that is not responding to the Tigrisso medicine and then continue with, with Tigrisso. So that's one way. Um, so if one or two new cancer areas show up or grow, we often radiate or more rarely surgically resect and then continue with the um, targeted therapy. So if the situation is multiple cancer areas are growing or um, for example, as in the question, new cancer sites in the brain occur, one of the important things is at least in, in our practice, we, we really try to biopsy patients again, whether it's through the blood or through the tumor tissue, to try to better understand what is the mechanism of resistance or why has this resistance shown up? Because as I mentioned, sometimes we are able to work around those, um, uh, work around those resistances. Specifically, if a patient has new uh, brain metastases um, often in that situation what we do is radiation therapy, whether it's just to one area or multiple areas, but that often is the, one of the, the better ways to control. We, we tend to try to use, so if a patient um, has brain metastases at diagnosis with an EGFR mutation, we often, so long as the patient's feeling well and not symptomatic, we try to use the Tigriso medicine first because that can get into those, into the brain tissue and work on tumors in the brain. Um, and then if that doesn't help, we move on to radiation therapy. Great. Okay. And then one more question for you before we go back to Dr. Dagogo Jack. Is there evidence of elevated liver enzymes when, taking, when starting Tigriso after having had immunotherapy treatment? That's, that's a great question um, because what we're learning is that the overlap of immunotherapy plus our targeted therapies can be quite dangerous for our patients. So a, a number of years ago when immunotherapy really first came on the scene, um, a number of studies, so preclinical studies, meaning uh, work in laboratories, really suggested that immunotherapy might augment the responses that we see for patients on targeted therapy. You know, it might help to shrink the cancer areas even more, or it might help to prolong how long people can stay on those targeted therapies. And so in some of the early phase one trials where immunotherapy was combined with targeted therapy, what a pattern has started to emerge, and that's kind of regardless of which targeted therapy you're using, which particular mutation or cancer abnormality you're going after, or really which uh, immunotherapy you're using, is that patients uh, tend to develop more toxicity related to therapy than expected for either targeted therapy or immunotherapy alone. And so in some of these trials, unfortunately, uh, a handful of patients became really sick or died because of complications due to the combination of targeted therapy and immunotherapy, excuse me, and one of the more, um, and, and hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity was one of those uh, really terrible side effects that unfortunately took some of the patients' lives. So what we understand more now is that combining the two does not seem to provide um, good benefit. And if someone is in a situation where they're going from one to the other, usually if, it, if patients go from targeted therapy to immunotherapy, you know, um, a really in-depth conversation needs to be had with their uh, cancer doctor to talk about the risks and benefits. But in general, that's thought to be reasonably safe in the sense of patients aren't um, uh, more uh, at risk of really unexpected bad side effects, but of course need to be under um, close observation with their cancer doctor. But if you go from immunotherapy to targeted therapy, 
even if you stop the drug maybe a few weeks ago, or excuse me, stop the immunotherapy a few weeks ago and then go on to targeted therapy, you're at an increased risk for those really bad side effects because immunotherapy sticks around in the body for a very long time. So these particular medicines are treatments that the body gets rid of after weeks rather than days like targeted therapy. Got it. Thanks. Okay. This one's for Dr. Dagogo Jack. What are treatment options for patients with leptomeningeal metastases? And you might want to define that term. So leptomeningeal uh, metastases. So the leptomeninges are the, it basically the meninges describes the layer of tissue or basically a jacket that's over your brain and your spinal cord. It's a protective covering. And there's a liquid in between them that you may be familiar with, uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And so leptomeningeal metastasis is when the cancer has learned to spread to that lining of the brain or spinal cord or into the cerebrospinal fluid. And so this can be a particularly tricky area to treat because traditionally when we think about chemotherapies, we all have a blood-brain barrier that helps, that basically prevents some certain chemotherapies and certain therapies that we give from actually even crossing into the brain. And it's it even even more difficult or even more challenging to get into that leptomeningeal space. It's one of the areas our body is fiercely protective of, from from our basically from infancy and from birth. And so the new drug development is actually being conducted with an eye towards developing drugs that have higher brain penetration and those that can actually get into the leptomeningeal space. I think it's just it's fortunate that many of the targeted therapies that we have actually can get into the leptomeningeal space and treat leptomeningeal metastases. For example, in EGFR-positive lung cancer, things like uh, the drug Tegrisol or osimertinib has activity or can shrink leptomeningeal metastases. In ALK-positive lung cancer, drugs like electinib, brigatinib, and uh, lorlatinib also have are able to get into this leptomeningeal space and treat these metastases. And I think that it, it is a very important question because it used to be one of those things where we didn't see it as often, but now as our patients are living longer, we do tend to see the cancer spread to some of these trickier areas. Traditionally, uh, in, radiation was the strategy for trying to treat this, but radiation isn't very effective for leptomeningeal metastases. So I think perhaps the most effective treatments we have for this type of spread of cancer is our targeted therapies. And unfortunately, not every subtype of lung cancer or molecular category of lung cancer has a drug that can penetrate that space. And I think it's a very important question and a very important area that, uh, that companies, pharmaceutical companies and pharmacists, pharmacologists, I think that when you're developing a drug, it's one of the areas that should really be thought of when designing new compounds. Great. Um, I think you might have answered the next question, but is there anything that you would like to add about controlling brain mets with radiotherapy or radiation? Yeah. So I think that uh, one, one important thing to point out in this question is that kind of the blanket term brain metastases, right? When the brain spreads to the can spreads to, when the cancer spreads to the brain. So the brain, in my head, I categorize it into two areas. They're parenchymal brain metastases, the traditional ones that are in the brain tissue. You can also have brain metastases in the skull, basically the, those are bone metastases actually, and you can also have brain metastases in that leptomeningeal space we talked about. And I, I think it's always important to make this, this, this distinction for my patients because when it's in the skull, we can typically treat it with our, our standard therapies. It's just like any bone metastasis. When it's in the brain tissue, things like radiation actually can be more effective than trying to give radiation for the leptomeningeal space. And the same principles that we talked about with the leptomeningeal uh, disease and targeting it with targeted therapies apply here. So the targeted therapies that, are, that have robust activity against leptomeningeal disease also are very effective and very active against brain metastases, the ones in the brain tissue itself. Radiation also is a good option. Some chemotherapies are actually uh, effective at shrinking brain metastases, including Alinta or Pemetrexid, one of the drugs that we commonly give for patients who have lung adenocarcinoma. And we also think that immune therapy actually has effects against these parenchymal or brain tissue metastases as well. And there's emerging data looking at immune therapy for leptomeningeal metastases too, with uh, some data suggesting that there may be some patients who respond to this approach.
Great, thanks. Okay, we're going to go back to Dr. Shank. Are there targeted therapies one can go on after chemotherapy? Um, so there always is the potential, and this is where uh, repeating biopsies can be very important. So, for example, let's say someone had a mutation or fusion where previously we could treat with TKIs, but we uh, went through all of the available TKIs that were appropriate and then went to chemotherapy. And once the chemotherapy was no longer effective, I would advocate for biopsying again in case um, a particular clone or one of the one of the cancer cells that was previously responsive to uh, targeted the the TKI targeted therapy has come up and is becoming a, a large proportion of the the cancer cells again. But I would also um, like to answer this with a more broad definition of targeted therapy. So even if a patient was not eligible for a TKI upfront, when the first therapy we try is no longer effective, we often still biopsy again. And in our practice, what we do is we also screen for not just the available, the ones that are, the therapies that are FDA approved, but we also screen for potential clinical trials. Um, in our clinical trial portfolio, we have a number of ADCs available. So we're often screening folks for one of those multiple targets the ADC is trying to go after. Okay, great. All right, back to D Dr. Dagogo Jack. And uh, you're sounding a little beepy, so I wonder if you can try and move your uh, cell phone away from the computer. I'm not sure if that would help. But um, Dr. Dagogo Jack, what are the treatment options for metast metastatic small cell lung cancer? So I think this is a good question. I think it's an important area to point out because a lot of what we've talked about has actually applied to non-small cell lung cancer, not not uh, small cell lung cancer. In small cell lung cancer, our targeted approaches or precision medicine isn't as advanced in the setting, but there's a lot of enthusiastic researchers and uh, who are collaborating to try to change that. For small cell lung cancer, our, our standard first-line approaches typically involve the combination of chemotherapy and immune therapy, and there's two regimens approved for this. One, the backbone is always kind of platinum plus etoposide, but it's either with uh, the immunotherapy drugs, atezolizumab or dervalumab are approved. As far as second-line treatments, there are approvals, but the, but the kind of relevance of these approvals has shifted a little bit with us moving forward with kind of upfront treatment with chemo-immunotherapy combinations. So there are second-line approvals for immune therapy combinations, including kind of uh, nevo, nevo, ipi, as well as uh, pembrolizumab in this space. But I do have some reluctance to give these therapies after a patient has already had their cancer grow on that combined with chemo. We also have another, uh, topotecan is another chemo that's approved for the second-line setting. And just recently, there was an approval for a drug called lurbanectidin, which impacts transcription. And transcription uh, basically affects which of our genes are expressed. And so it, it, so it may be that in some cancers, the genes that promote cancer are overexpressed or, or expressed more, and those that suppress cancer are underexpressed. And so by modulating that or kind of controlling that on the scale, you may be able to rein the cancer in. And so this is a drug approved after first-line treatment. And it was approved based on a study that showed that about a third of patients responded to it. So I'm excited to have that as an option. It, it, it is like most of our other chemos in that it does cause some toxicity on your blood count, so you have to keep an eye on the blood counts during therapy. Great. And um, Dr. Shank might need to hop off since I'm going to switch uh, who's getting the next question. So the next one's going to be for Dr. Shank. Um, what percentage of per patients can't tolerate immunotherapies because of pneumonitis and colitis? Uh, in my clinical experience, usually it's pretty small. Um, we've become more and more familiar with these immunotherapies in clinical practice and often can manage things quick enough that if one of those side effects does start to emerge, we can treat and then have a conversation about whether or not to try again. I think in the clinical trials, it was a few percentage points of patients who had 
such significant side effects with immunotherapy alone, and this is only in the lung cancer space. So, for example, in the melanoma space, it's often the first, the, the first treatment is often combined immunotherapies, and that has a significant increased risk in either pneumonitis or colitis um, that is so severe that patients can no longer have those immune therapies. So I would um, encourage that, you know, regardless of the therapy you're on, but specifically for this, for the immunotherapy question, um, the side effects I, um, that you should always be aware of and let your um, doctor or your team know is if you feel like you're starting to get more short of breath or your breathing is just different in, in some fashion, or if you're starting to have more diarrhea, because of course those are signs that you're having either colitis or pneumonitis due to immune therapy, and uh, intervening sooner helps to reduce the severity of those side effects. Good, and I'm gonna give you the last question because um, since you need to leave Dr. DeGogo, Jack will handle all the questions that are coming in, so I'm gonna give her a little break. Um, how can we make sure every patient who needs to receive biomarker testing gets it regardless of where they receive care? That's a yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question, and I'm very passionate about helping patients, you know, get what they you know get all the information they need to help them and their doctors make the right decisions for them. Um, this has been an issue even from the the advent and incorporation of targeted therapies into the national treatment guidelines. Um, one of the ways, of course, with more and more approvals, especially in the lung cancer space, I wonder if it might not just become reflexive to test for all of the mutations, fusions, amplifications, immunological biomarkers just in one shot so it, it doesn't rely on um, uh, someone remembering to do it, so to speak. That's, that's one possibility. And I think the other possibility is really, you know, um, helping patients regardless of whether you know, I take care of them in the clinic or I speak with them at a conference, for example, but really you know, helping them understand the, the role these markers play in how, how they can be treated and really advocating for themselves for um, getting the information from their doctor or team taking care of them and asking really you know, what, what biomarker testing was performed, what are the results, can I have a copy of these? And just, you know, opening up that conversation. Because while sometimes the biomarker results can um, uh, help us in initial treatments, oftentimes uh, if there isn't a specific targeted therapy available uh, right away, oftentimes the, the information we can get from these um, biomarker testing panels is, is helpful in, in making decisions about clinical trials or, you know, seeing if um, another biopsy might be helpful. Great. Okay, now we're going to go, thank you so much for your time, and um, now we're going to go to the questions that came in. Um, thank you, Carly, a pleasure. Thank you. So it's going to be fast and furious because I want to try and get through as many as possible. Are you ready, Dr. DeGogo, Jack? Yes, I'll try. For the lightning round? Okay. Um, when do you know if your cancer is dri being driven by a new mutation and how often should you biopsy? I think that's a very, very excellent question. And I, I think that we can't, in clinical, kind of in current practice, ideally the, the cancer should be biopsied each time that it starts to grow on a new therapy, particularly in the context of targeted therapies. So I, I think that there's a lot said there that needs to be unpacked in the sense that we think about the way the things that cause cancers to change shape or to get new mutations have to do with a term that we call selective pressure. And so it, you don't really get that from chemotherapy. So if you give a person a targeted therapy, the cancer is basically you're imposing a selective pressure by blocking a particular signal. And so the cancer tries to find ways to escape around it. And so each time the cancer grows on that, one has to assume that the cancer has found a new mechanism to escape that. And for us to have the most informed approach for next line strategies, it's often helpful to then biopsy either a blood biopsy or a tissue biopsy at that time point to figure out what new mutations, what new growth signals are present, and see if we have approaches that can target those. 
I mentioned that a blood biopsy and a tissue biopsy are both feasible options. Obviously, a blood biopsy is most convenient, but sometimes in rare cases, we see that the cancer has actually changed its shape completely and become a small cell lung cancer. You cannot tell that from a blood biopsy, and so when possible, it's great to get a tissue biopsy in this context, particularly for cancers that are growing very rapidly all of a sudden and had been demonstrating kind of very good control or very slow progression. Great. Next one is, can you tell me the incidence of a somatic BRCA2 mutation in non-small cell lung cancer? I haven't heard of this happening, but can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I can I can tell you a little bit more about the question, but I, as far as the, I think it's probably very rare in lung cancer, and I think that the, what the question is asking for everyone is that, so there's genetic mutations and there's somatic mutations, right? Genetic ones are the ones, or heritable, the ones you inherit from a family member. We know that having inheriting a BRCA mutation predisposes to develop breast, ovarian, prostate cancers, and now pancreas cancers we're seeing. And there's somatic mutations, which means that it just, you don't inherit it from someone, but it just happens in one of your cells, and it, it, it drives cancers in a similar fashion. We think that these BRCA mutations affect the way that your cancer repairs, you're, you're basically your cells repair mistakes that are made, and they may confer some increased sensitivity to drugs that target DNA damage. As far as I know, we don't see these often in lung cancer, but I would have to look at larger data sets to parse that out. Got it. This is a really good question. What about if you don't have a genomic mutation, and also um, what about if you don't have high levels of PDL1? Those can be two different questions. Yeah. So the second one is a little bit easier to answer. So if you don't have, I think it's always important to separate, to think about PDL1 expression a bit more critically in the context of our patients who get uh, targeted therapies. Because honestly, we think of PDL1 expression in this patient population as not being as predictive for be of benefit from uh, immunotherapies as it might be in someone who's, who's someone who's smoked before or someone who has other types of mutations. We think there that it may be that the oncogene, the, the ALK, the EGFR, is causing that PDL1 expression, and it's not actually your immune system. It's not actually engaging your immune system. So I think it's important to separate those two. But in general, when patients have low PDL1 or no PDL1 expression, our therapeutic or our treatment paradigm is to give people the first line treatment as a combination of chemo plus immune therapy because we see that it still benefits people who don't have uh, expression. And perhaps it's the synergy of the two, perhaps the chemo then awakens the immune system by releasing the tumor specific proteins into the bloodstream. So we don't know, people are still studying that. And the first question was, what, what are the options if you don't have an, a, a, target, a mutation? So what I would say is that every cancer probably has a mutation, to be honest. It's just that our panels may be too small to pick them up, and we may not know how to target them or how to kind of exploit those mutations now. And so in these settings, I've turned towards kind of traditional chemotherapy, but also thinking about our ADCs or antibody drug conjugates. because. It, a mutation, there isn't always a, such a kind of clear-cut relationship between having a mutation and having increased expression of a different type of protein on the surface. And so for an, that, this is one of the reasons that antibody drug conjugates are very exciting in that they can, uh, they can be accessible to patients who don't have mutations and their cancers may still express proteins at a higher level on cancer cells than normal cells and you can still exploit that to give selective delivery of chemotherapy to, these, to their cancer cells. So I would look at some of these, what we call genotype uh, agnostic strategies, right, where it doesn't matter if you have a mutation and exploit other ways to target a, a cancer-specific change. Great. We actually have a very specific question about um, the ADCs, the anti-conjugate there. What is this for? I <laughs> just blank for Anti-drug conjugate. Yeah, anti-drug conjugate. conjugate. No, antibody drug conjugate, sorry. Antibody drug conjugate. Can those therapies work for transmembrane domain mutations in HER2, like exon 17, if they're designed to recognize surface proteins? I would say in theory they should, right, because you're recognizing something as external as possible. So it, in theory it should. And actually, I think one of the interesting things is that it can, it, so it, it isn't always clear with HER2 on it, when you look at the data. HER2 mutations do not always drive 
uh, very high levels of expression of HER2 on the surface of cancer cells. So there's a unique relationship between that, whereas kind of something like an ALK rearrangement, we know that and for an ALK rearrangement to be functional, it has to lead to abnormal expression of the ALK protein. But that relationship isn't as precise in HER2, but we know that these drugs still work when so even for tumors that have very little expression of HER2. And I think that that's where the science, the, the science is heading, right, trying to figure out why it works in some of these tumors, what are the mechanisms in these, in these areas. But we think that people who have any kind of alteration or any abnormal dependence in their tumor to these growth signals may be particularly susceptible to ADCs that target the uh, particular receptor or growth signal. Great. After TKI resistance, what's next for EGFR? Yeah, and so I'm assuming that this question is asking after uh, someone with the TKI, presuming kind of in our typical practice, we tend to give osimertinib as the first-line therapy, and that's based on data comparing it to older EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like erlotinib and gefitinib, which demonstrated in that study that the, the median progression-free survival was about 19 months uh, versus 10 months, so people had longer responses to this. But after, it's important for your next line strategies to kind of figure out why, as Dr. Shank was saying, why the cancer has morphed or stopped responding. Sometimes it's due to a, a different growth signal called MET. In that case, there's studies showing that it, usually we do this on trial, that it may be combining that EGFR targeted therapy with a MET targeted therapy can rescue or salvage the response and shrink the tumors again. Sometimes it's because there's a, rarely, it's because there's another EGFR mutation that perhaps may be sensitive to an earlier EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. One of the ones that we've pushed aside for now may actually work again in that context. And sometimes it's because the cancer has changed shape and is a small cell. In that case, we give chemo. And, you know, sometimes we find other things that we can't target and we give chemo in that context as well. There, there's a, there's uh, trials that are launched re that were recently launched that basically cover many of these scenarios and based on what the biopsy shows assign you to receive different uh, combinations of therapies versus chemo plus uh, in, plus the EGFR TKI. So I think it really depends on the mechanism of resistance. Great. Um, is a combination cancer type like adenosquamous harder to treat than a single type? Or is the genetics of the tumor, regardless of type, what really determines treatability and outcome? Yeah, I would say that the honest, I would say the jury's still out. And so adenosquamous is one that we, off, we, we do tend to see with EGFR mutations, too. I think that where it can be a little bit tricky to manage those types of tumors is when we think about chemos, because we tend to pick our chemo based on the histology, based on studies kind of in the early 2000s that suggested that some adenocarcinomas may respond better to a particular chemo cocktail than squamous is and vice versa. But we tend to think that if there's an EGFR mutation or an ALK rearrangement, just as an example, but many other, this applies to many other alterations, that it should drive the cancer the same irrespective of the histology. The one part that's a little bit tough is that we're finding in these transformations where the cancer becomes a small cell or a squamous, it does not necessarily depend as much on that EGFR growth signal. And so it's possible, at least in retrospective studies, when people go back and look at the outcomes of all their patients, and they say, gee, it looks like patients who have squamous tumors that have these mutations may not respond as well to the targeted therapy as someone who has an adenocarcinoma. So the way I would, I guess what I would say is that I would still treat, and then I, but I would keep in mind that it's possible that there may be a less robust or a less durable response. Great. What percentage of patients are getting biomarker testing at diagnosis? That might be a difficult question for you to answer, but I'd love your thoughts. And then also, are there any patients who you will prescribe a treatment regimen without having that biomarker data in hand? So for the first question, I think it's tough to give you exact numbers, but I can honestly say not enough, and it depends on where you're practicing. And so there's been a lot of studies that have come out recently that are showing that we something I, I, I struggle to pull up the number, but something I think like abysmal, like something like 30% of patients were actually getting the testing they needed. And I think it's even more complicated than that, right? As we're getting more and more targets or relevant mutations, it becomes incumbent to test more. And so it's tough to encompass that in single gene assays that just look individually for each one of these mutations or alterations. 
and next generation sequencing really becomes the more practical and kind of obvious answer to this. And so I think that what it packs into that question is the question of whether or not people are getting testing in general and are they getting complete or comprehensive testing. And so it's not uncommon for me to get patients referred to me who've had testing and been told they don't have an alteration, but it turns out that they did because when they were tested, they only tested for three things. And so I think that we, it's important to raise awareness, and I think it's also important that no matter where our patients live, they're able to access this comprehensive testing, and that'll take some work. And I think certainly a lot of work from our patient advocacy, group, advocacy groups, they've been very helpful to, uh, in this area. Great. Well, we're just at time, um, and sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions, but hopefully we'll find a way to answer them for you, whether it's um, an email or we'll, we'll look into how we can do that because they're great questions. Um, but I just wanted to, again, thank our supporters and thank our speakers for um, a wonderful event. I certainly learned a lot, and look out for an email about how you can access a recording about this and about our new resources. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.